Welcome to Autocracy Now, a show about the lives of famous autocrats. In this episode, Stalin takes control. By the end of 1919, it was becoming clear that the Bolsheviks were winning the Civil War. The White Armies, divided as they were, and with their political aims confused, a loose coalition running the gamut from monarchists to non-Bolshevik socialists, were picked off and defeated one by one by the Red Army. They may have controlled a lot of territory in Siberia and near the River Don, but they never seized the industrial heartland of Russia, and were therefore vulnerable. The half-hearted foreign interventions never really got off the ground, and the foreign governments were unwilling to provide too much backing to white forces. The war was brutal in the extreme. Terror was used on both sides. The Cheka, which was Lenin's secret police that effectively replaced the Okhrana, were far more willing to kill than the whites. It is impossible to be exact about numbers, but hundreds of thousands were likely executed by both sides for treason or desertion, alongside the hundreds of thousands who died directly in battle. A campaign against the Cossacks, part of the Red Terror, would kill 300,000 of them between 1917 and 1933. Famine and disease were widespread, as they so often are in times of war. Typhus alone killed 3 million people in the year of 1920. For a state that had struggled through a losing war since 1914, it is difficult to imagine the levels of devastation under the Russian Civil War. Yet there were still Bolsheviks who viewed the military mobilisation that it brought, as an opportunity to extend the revolution to the countries of Europe, just as their ideology had always demanded. This would be the source of the latest split in the party. Initially, Stalin, who was after all still on the front fighting the remains of the White Armies until 1920, urged Lenin to reconsider, when he learned that Lenin was planning to invade Poland as the first step in exporting the revolution to Europe. They were militarily weak, and pursuing a war with Poland would leave them open to attack from the resurgent whites. But Lenin didn't share these fears, he had an unshakable belief that the proletariat would rise up and depose the leadership in these foreign countries once they were given a little encouragement. So he didn't really view invading Poland as a war of conquest, just a, a prompt to begin the revolution. Germany, having had the humiliating Treaty of Versailles imposed upon it, was filled with radical politics, and Lenin hoped there that a communist regime could overthrow the newly created Weimar Republic, and the dominoes would just continue to topple. Stalin lost the argument and, as so often in his disputes with Lenin, immediately became a true believer in the international revolution. He knew what side his bread was buttered on, the most important thing for Stalin was to remain dead, steadfastly loyal to Lenin. Some of the correspondence between Lenin and Stalin makes for interesting reading at this time. They were busy debating whether to abolish the borders between Germany and Russia, as Lenin wanted, or allow them to continue on as independent communist nations. All this when the Red Army didn't even control all the territory in Russia itself, and the country itself was in dire straits. It just goes to show how divorced the Bolsheviks could often be from reality, dreaming of a world revolution while they still didn't control all the territory in their own country. Stalin knew that his best interest was in slavish loyalty to Lenin, so almost overnight he went from being reluctant to invade Poland to becoming a war hawk. He telegraphed Lenin saying, quote, The Poles are experiencing a collapse from which they will not soon recover. The more firmly we conduct ourselves, the better it will be for both us and the international revolution. End quote. Already, the ideological dividing lines of the next great squabble in the Bolsheviks were being drawn up. Stalin would eventually become champion of socialism in one country, which argued for a drawing back of international ambitions in favour of a demonstration of the superiority of the Soviet system. Countries would then inevitably overthrow their governments without needing to be directly invaded. But right now, he recognised the necessity of siding with Lenin. Not that this political manoeuvring served him well, at least not in the short term. The Red Army was dangerously overextended already, and when it met with concerted Polish resistance at the Battle of Warsaw, the attempt to take Poland was effectively defeated. It had been overambitious and had probably relied on an internal uprising that had failed to materialise. Forces were transferred back towards the interior of the country in the Ukraine to fight against white armies. As for Stalin, he took a great deal of the blame for the affair, partly for complaints that he was looking to capture the city of Lvov for personal glory rather than as part of a wider strategic plan, and partly for refusing to sign an order that would have transferred troops away from his front until it was too late. In September of 1920, he resigned from military duties, steaming with resentment towards Lenin and Trotsky for failing to appreciate his efforts in the war. Trotsky took the opportunity of Stalin's resignation, which was the latest in a long line of incidents where Stalin dramatically flounced off after something didn't go his way, to launch an attack on him over his war record, which deepened the rivalry between Trotsky and Stalin. At this point, Stalin meekly refused to defend himself, probably fearing that his political position was too weak to force Lenin into choosing between his two favourite deputies. Yet there is no doubt that every incident like this sealed Trotsky's eventual doom. <clears throat> As military conflict began to wind down, the Bolshevik focus turned inward. They had, in a prolonged and bloody struggle, suppressed any force that could reasonably hope to overthrow them, 
at least as far as the white counter-revolution was concerned. Now the concern was economic. This is where the idealism of Marx's doctrine runs headfirst into reality. It kind of reminds me a little bit of that old joke, maybe you know it, there's a format that's a little bit like, step one, acquire all of the kittens. Step two, feed and house all of the kittens. Step three, question mark, question mark, question mark. Step four, profit. Except in the case of Marxism, there was step one, overthrow the capitalists and the bourgeoisie. Step two, assume state power on behalf of the people or the proletariat. Step three, question mark, question mark, question mark. Step four, socialist utopia. It is in this transition stage, the question mark, question mark, question mark stage, that the tragedy of communism really lies, because it is in this stage that every communist revolution has descended into some form of despotism or another, or else postponed the establishment of the socialist utopia indefinitely. So in this interim stage, while Lenin was ruling on behalf of the people, what economic policy were they supposed to pursue? During the war, the answer was a policy called war communism. To call this a really coherent policy is a little bit misleading. It essentially just allowed the state to control everything it needed in order to win the war. Indeed, Fige calls it not a policy to assist in the civil war, but a means of waging the civil war. Factories and agriculture were commandeered by the Bolsheviks. Private enterprise was completely banned. Workers were not permitted to strike. Grain was requisitioned by the army. Everything was sort of nationalised and sort of just hijacked in order to win the war. This policy worked in its aim of ensuring the army was supplied and was forced through by the Red Terror, but the economic and social results of these policies were devastating. The peasants often refused to have their food requisitioned, that is to say stolen, on behalf of a socialist army, and they were dealt with brutally. Famines were unquantifiably bad. Massive revolts like the Tambov Rebellion lasted for a few years after the Civil War. The currency utterly collapsed, as you might expect with no private business, and barter took over from most forms of exchange. The rationing system was undercut by an expansive black market in goods and services. It was becoming clear that the system of war communism could not continue without the war to, at least in part, justify it, and without troops in every region enforcing its goals. Yet the socialist utopia had not manifested itself. The seizing of the means of production by the workers, or at least their self-appointed representatives, had happened, but what happened next was far from clear. There was need for a new economic policy, which Lenin helpfully dubbed the New Economic Policy, or NEP. The key goal of this was really to quell the peasant revolts, and so the major shift was that peasants would now have their grain taxed rather than requisitioned, and they would be free to sell any surplus on a relatively open market. They now once again had the incentive to produce more than they needed for survival. This injection of capitalism into the system worked, and a slow economic recovery would begin under the NEP. But new dividing lines sprang up. Trotsky believed that the transition from communism could only occur if the state took control of everything and allocated all of the resources presumably eventually heading towards from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Stalin and his ally Bukharin favoured a sort of state-run capitalism along the lines of the NEP. It was clear that Lenin recognised the necessity of the NEP, even though it went against all of his socialist principles, to allow the state to recover, but of course it was divisive. It was in need of a staunch ally that Lenin turned to Stalin to become the general secretary of the Communist Party. There's a traditional narrative that Stalin was a dull bureaucrat, and he gained his power by managing to outdull everyone else. That he was a man who was willing to sit through endless interminable meetings, quibble over the footnotes of the speeches and debates in the party, and gradually, slowly, boringly tip the balance in his favour. Robert Service disagrees with this review, and it doesn't fit with my image of Stalin as a man, both based on what he had done today and what was about to come. He was not a pen pusher, as his brutal campaigns in the Civil War had shown. I don't think this image is a real reflection of his personality, but more like his lack of options. He was not charismatic and inspirational like Trotsky, who had spent the Civil War tirelessly dashing to various fronts on his train to boost morale, and who contributed to Marxist theory with eloquent speeches. He did not really present any coherent ideological direction in most areas, beyond being just a slavish follower of Lenin. What he did recognise was that the dull-sounding office of the General Secretaryship would allow him to accumulate power and influence, and that staying in the shadows while other adversaries duke it out could be an advantage. This is not a bad strategy, and it's worked well for some leaders in recent times, too. In May of 1922, Lenin suffered a massive stroke. At this point, he would be sidelined and more or less confined to his house, recuperating. The games to decide who would succeed him were already beginning. Stalin was a frequent visitor to his house in the role of general secretary, communicating developments in the capital, but the two were far from close friends and allies. Lenin became increasingly suspicious of Stalin, and they fell out over the question of nationalities, 
what was to be done with all the various republics and national identities that were within their new state. Lenin gradually came to align himself with Trotsky as he and Stalin argued about a wider range of issues. Things got personal when Stalin swore at Lenin's wife and he demanded an apology. Interestingly, this incident clearly had a lasting impact on Stalin's psyche. When he died in 1953, three letters were discovered hidden in his desk. One of them was the note where Lenin demanded this apology for swearing at his wife. This argument culminated at the end of the year, in December of 1922, when Lenin wrote a series of documents about other members of the party leadership. He most likely intended these to be a guide as to who should succeed him, and indeed the documents have become known as Lenin's Testament, and they were not kind to Stalin. Quote, Comrade Stalin, having become Secretary General, has unlimited authority concentrated in his hands, and I'm not sure whether he'll always be capable of using that authority with sufficient caution. Comrade Trotsky, on the other hand, as his struggle against the Central Committee on the question of the People's Commissariat of Communications has already proved, is distinguished not only by outstanding ability. He is personally perhaps the most capable man in the present Central Committee, but he has displayed excessive self-assurance and has shown excessive preoccupation with the purely administrative side of the work. These two qualities of the two outstanding leaders of the present Central Committee can inadvertently lead to a split, and if our party does not take steps to avert this, the split may come unexpectedly. End quote. A few weeks later, as their personal dispute grew more bitter, Lenin tacked on a much harsher judgment of Stalin, which kind of indicates that he'd already picked his side in the rivalry. He said, quote, Stalin is too rude, and this defect, although quite tolerable in our midst and in dealing amongst us communists, becomes intolerable in a secretary general. That is why I suggest that the comrades think about a way of removing Stalin from that post and appointing another man in his stead, who, in all other respects, differs from Comrade Stalin, in having only one advantage, namely that of being more tolerant, more loyal, more polite and more considerate to the comrades, less capricious, etc. End quote. If these remarks had been widely circulated, it probably would have spelt the end for Stalin's political ambitions. Yet, in part due to his position as General Secretary, he got wind of them in advance. They were known to others, probably to Zinoviev and Kamenev, who were also on the Politburo, that's the council of leaders that ran the state under the Bolsheviks. But they, like Lenin, continually underestimated Stalin. They were more concerned that Trotsky, who had clashed with Lenin on ideological grounds on many occasions, was going to use his popularity in the Red Army to establish a military dictatorship and take the state in his own direction. Again we see how the intellectualism of this cadre of Bolsheviks meant they were blind to political realities. Stalin didn't seem like a true competitor or Lenin's spiritual successor, because he hadn't contributed to Marxist doctrine, while Trotsky had. So there was already a natural rift in the party that Stalin could use for that most beloved of dictatorial strategies, divide and conquer. Both Zinoviev and Kamenev had ambitions to lead the party for themselves and viewed Stalin as mediocre. Each of the three of them likely hoped to use the others to defeat Trotsky before seizing power for himself. It was this triumvirate, that is a rule of three, that dominated Russian politics as Lenin's condition deteriorated. Stalin would take control over Lenin's doctors and seriously restricted his political activities, restricting his visitors and his correspondence, all in the name of helping him recover more quickly, of course. It was a whimpering end for the man who had been the autocratic ruler, first of his party, then of the Russian state. I feel that Lenin, in spite of his readiness to use terror and violence against his enemies, has a slightly better reputation than Stalin. All of his successors found it politically useful to glorify him, which has probably helped. Even while I was writing this episode, walking around in my university town, I saw a sticker on a phone box advertising a socialist demonstration. The image of Lenin was prominent on the sticker. Okay, so it's not as if this is a particularly widespread point of view. But whoever made the sticker obviously felt that Lenin was a better poster boy than Stalin, or even Marx, who actually came up with communism in the first place. Steve Bannon, the controversial advisor to Donald Trump, described himself as a Leninist, in terms of wanting to smash the state. Would he associate himself with Stalin so readily? I think that there's a tendency to associate Lenin more with the ideals and dream of socialism. He was an intellectual, people think, who decided, intellectually, that the socialist paradise he would establish would be worth the blood that must be spilled to establish it. He described himself as being in love with Marx and Engels, and was an intentionally emotional and charismatic man, charisma that Stalin could never match. The fanaticism of his belief in socialist ideals justified almost anything in his eyes. Such people are dangerous. The dream of socialism was undeniably appealing. I feel that one of the key threads running through the story of our species in the last century or two has been the inability of human morality, human society and human institutions to adapt to rapid technological advancement. The things we invent are evolving faster than us. Socialism, at least, had a positive rather than reactionary approach to this development. 
Industrialization and mechanization would ease the load on the worker. The rapid increase in productivity would naturally be twinned with an increase in the standard of living. Increased transport and freedom of movement for peoples would erase national boundaries. Liberal ideals of justice and equality would find their ultimate realization in a system to which everyone con contributed, from which everyone benefited. Inequality would be eradicated. You know, there's no longer going to be a system where workers are exploited by rich capitalists who end up with far more wealth than the rest of us. It was a utopian vision, and in a lot of ways it embraced the future in a way that the politics of today still doesn't seem to do. But it must be remembered that the apparatus of terror, brutality and state control that we think about when we think of Stalinism was all first created under Lenin. He swept aside the fledgling institutions of Russian democracy. Well, even his fellow Bolsheviks like Trotsky, Zinoviev and Kamenev advocated working with other socialist parties like the Socialist Revolutionaries and the Mensheviks, Lenin was convinced that him and his faction had to lead the revolution and repressed even those who shared many of his socialist ideals. Like Stalin, he was a paranoid man, seeing counter-revolutionary conspiracies everywhere, and like Stalin, he was utterly ruthless in dealing with any opposition. Even within his own party, he insisted on centralised control. Had he lived, there's every chance he would have been as brutal an autocrat, remembered for systematic oppression and terror throughout his rule. Instead, our final image of him is as the impotent man, confined to his home, dictating frantic letters denouncing party leaders, and despairing about the course of the revolution that had been his life's work. Many of his last letters betray a great fear that Russia was not ready for socialism, that it could not be imposed above, as he dreamed. Perhaps he was right. In March of 1923, Lenin suffered a debilitating heart attack. He had written his last documents, and would be confined to his house for most of the rest of his life, unable to speak, until he eventually died in January of 1924. Stalin was apparently heard to mutter a complaint about the time this took. He said, couldn't even die like a real leader. Stalin no longer needed to worry about Lenin trying to depose him from his position of power, providing he was at least able to suppress his last testament. In this he had some help from members of the Politburo, as none of them came out especially well from the last testament. For example, Bukharin, another key member of the Politburo, was criticised for not being a true believer in Marxism. It's true that he was a keen supporter of the NEP, which was closer to state capitalism than real communism. So these members of the Politburo would be on his side for now. His bureaucratic powers as General Secretary allowed him to delay meetings like the Party Congress, gradually promote his supporters to key positions of influence while demoting, or simply moving away, supporters of Trotsky and other rivals. Even seemingly mundane tasks like controlling the schedules of meetings allowed him to set the tone and nature of the political debate. He made sure that Trotsky missed Lenin's funeral. The, Le the Central Committee was gradually packed with loyalists. As General Secretary, Stalin accrued as much information as possible about his rivals and potential allies or subordinates. He even had an apparatus to eavesdrop on the conversations of Politburo members. When Kamenev asked him about gaining a majority in the party, Stalin showed his willingness to engage in subterfuge. He said, quote, I believe that who votes is unimportant. What is very important is who counts the votes and how they're recorded. Yet the attack was two-pronged. It's not entirely fair to say that Stalin ascended to the throne of Russia through a mixture of skullduggery and bureaucracy. He won the political battle too. He organised Lenin's funeral and ensured that Trotsky could not attend by holding it soon after his death or Trotsky was away. He was behind the movement to have Lenin's body embalmed and permanently displayed. The imagery that Stalin used with reference to Lenin was glowing, almost religious. Petrograd was renamed Leningrad. Stalin published a book that summarised what he thought of as the principles of Leninism. It was obvious what Stalin was trying to do. By deifying Lenin, and associating himself with Lenin as much as possible, he was hoping to bask in the reflected glory of the dead Bolshevik. It helped to emphasise any disputes and differences in policy that Lenin and Trotsky had had. As far as politics went, Trotsky had always been something of an outsider. He still advocated the international revolution, saying that the revolution could not survive unless it became global, as Stalin moved towards the policy of socialism in one country. Trotsky wanted the state to take full control of the economy and increase industrial production, and was therefore opposed to the NEP, while Stalin and Bukharin continued to support it. Given that Trotsky was demanding a radical departure from existing policies, it was easy to portray him as an outsider, and argue that his doctrine would throw the country back into turmoil, just as it was beginning to recover. Stalin was portraying himself as a continuity candidate, with Lenin, and this worked incredibly well. By the time Trotsky realised that he needed to act, it was probably already too late. He banked on portraying himself as the true representative of the people against the party bureaucracy, and led a movement called the Left Opposition, but this did not endear him to any of the other members of the Politburo, 
or shield him from accusations of trying to take over an Ruelo military dictatorship, or prevent them from painting him as an outsider. When I saw Robert Service talk about Stalin and the Russian Revolution the other day, one of the things he mentioned was that, in the absence of Russia's traditional institutions, the only thing that they could fall back on was the party. When the Bolsheviks were trying to govern, party loyalty and party bureaucracy became the only institutions that they could rely on. They couldn't rely on the old institutions of state, and they couldn't rely on the army. So, being a factionalist against the main body of the party was political death. The triumvirate were therefore able to denounce him for disagreeing with Lenin before the revolution, and for Trotsky's mistakes in the civil war. Zinoviev and Kamenev denounced Trotsky for factionalism and trying to split the party, and Stalin, who probably hated him most of all, got to play the part of the voice of moderation by advising them not to have Trotsky expelled from the party. That will come later. It seemed that he'd been defeated as a political force. He'd spent the year of 1925 in the political wilderness, and even described this period of time as taking a break from politics. Naturally, as soon as they felt like Trotsky was no longer a threat, the three-way marriage of convenience between Stalin, Zinoviev and Kamenev collapsed. After all, they really had very little in common beyond hating Trotsky. Zinoviev and Kamenev's political positions were closer to that of Trotsky than that of Stalin. Zinoviev and Kamenev began to rail against Stalin and Bukharin for supporting the NEP, which, after all, was a long way from true communism. By December 1925, Stalin was making a rather paradoxical statement. Quote, The party wants unity, and we will have unity with Zinoviev and Kamenev if this is what they want, and without them if they don't want it. End quote. So, you know, it's that special kind of call for unity that means, let's be united under my authority. Yet it did seem to work. After all, the Bolshevik mindset is based on paranoia. They were an underground cell of revolutionaries for decades, constantly looking over their shoulders and trying to calculate which of their allies was secretly being paid by the Okhrana. Stalin himself was regularly accused of being an agent of the Okhrana in the early days of the revolution, especially after he had so many easy escapes from imprisonment. The party had undergone several splits that had undermined their authority, like the split with the Mensheviks, and they were used to an authoritarian leader in the form of Lenin. So when Zinoviev and Kamenev split from the party, and accused Stalin of becoming an autocratic ruler, they were going against the grain of party politics. It was easy to portray them as splitters from the main body, rather than representing the mass of opinion. The party was well aware that there were still huge threats to its authority from the outside. Not just from suppressed political parties like cadets and socialist revolutionaries, or the nationalist rebellious movements in the empire, but also from new wealthy classes of NEP men who were beginning to gain in status, and from wealthy peasants or kulaks who had profited from the relaxation on grain requisition. These people had a vested interest in the return of capitalism. The reality was that the vast majority of the population were not really ideological converts to communism. Sure, the party had won the civil war, but there were a million members of the party out of 147 million people in the nation, and most of the members of the party were hardly raving Marxists, you know. They just knew that it was the best way to get ahead in Russia. So to seem to split the movement when it felt vulnerable was a bad move politically. Stalin realised all of this, of course, and felt he could just bide his time, the champion of the status quo, until Zinoviev and Kamenev shot themselves in the foot. By 1926, they had formed a united opposition with Trotsky, but, like Trotsky's left opposition, it struggled. I mean, I question why they even referred to themselves as the opposition. That in itself seems like a bad move. Allying with Trotsky, who had been kicked out of the Politburo, they ran afoul of Lenin's ban on factions within the party. They organised demonstrations, including one with Lenin's widow, the very woman Stalin had war- sworn at causing their final fatal row, which led Stalin to say in private that she was, quote, a splitter and should be beaten like a splitter. Clearly, Stalin did not get over arguing with people that well. But the left opposition failed to persuade anyone that they were the real standard bearers of Lenin's legacy. The party congress voted overwhelmingly to expel members who supported them in 1927, at all levels of the hierarchy, which diminished their support. Stalin's grip on internal power in the party tightened, and, by the end of 1927, Zinoviev and Trotsky had been expelled from the party entirely. They would later be readmitted, but they'd never again hold significant political influence. Of the original members of the Politburo that Lenin had formed in 1917, only Stalin remained. So, leaving Stalin politically in the ascendancy, I'm going to finish this episode by looping back around and discussing how his personal life has changed. After all, on this front, we last left him at the funeral of his first wife, and sending his son to be cared for by in-laws so that he could focus on revolutionary politics. By the end of the 1920s, things had changed. Joseph Stalin likely first met Nazesta Aludyeva, or Narja, when the latter was still a child. She was the daughter of a Russian revolutionary, 
and her father sheltered Stalin briefly after one of his escapes from exile in the early era of his career, around 1911. Simon Sibagmon Fury, in his marvellous book, Stalin, the Court of the Red Tsar, puts the initial meeting at 1904. Nadia would have been three years old at this point. One wonders if maybe there was a degree of hero worship for her early on. After all, she saw this man, this dashing revolutionary figure, drifting in and out of the family home, on the way to and from some secret mission to overthrow the hated state and establish a utopia. Certainly, Nadia agreed with her father's ideas when she developed a political conscience, and, when she grew up, she too became a Bolshevik and worked for Lenin's office as a secretary briefly. It was likely here that she really came to Stalin's attention. When Stalin moved to Tsaritsyn during the Civil War in 1919, ready to seize those broad military powers and engage in terrorising peasants and attempting to drown old Tsarist military officers, Nadia, now a typist, and her father accompanied him. She was 17 years old, and it's very likely that, on the same train that served as his roving military headquarters, they became lovers. I focus on Nadia's age not to sensationalise things excessively. Besides, we already know that Stalin was no respecter of age differences. But because I think it's relevant in explaining how he became such a looming presence in her life. It's possible that this was her first love. Do you remember yours? It can loom large over you. By 1919 they were married. In 1921 their first son, Vasily Stalin, was born. It was around this time that the initial sugar rush of any relationship had begun to turn sour. While Stalin, possibly influenced by traditional patriarchal Georgian values, and maybe just by considerations of his own convenience, he wanted a wife who would stay at home and care for the children. But Nadia always wanted her own revolutionary career and independence. Stalin, however, was hardly willing to leave her free of work. In 1921, he visited Georgia again on party business, and he retrieved his mother, Keke, who asked him, You don't have any of the Tsar's blood on your hands, do you, son? And I suppose technically he didn't, with the Tsar's execution in 1918 being approved by Lenin and carried out by the Ural Soviet. But there was more than enough blood on Stalin's hands already. He also sought out his son, Yakov, by his first wife, and brought him back into the family home. That wasn't enough, though. There was a Bolshevik tradition, which might seem strange among such fanatics, that the orphan children of revolutionaries who died young, especially in the cause of the revolution, would be taken care of by other revolutionaries. I guess this policy is, in a way, kind of practical. If you're going to choose a lifestyle where the likelihood of arrest or death is high, you want to know that your children are going to be taken care of. In July 1921, one of Stalin's comrades, Sergeyev, died in a plane crash, and his son was adopted by Stalin. With three children of varying ages, Nadia found little time to pursue her own revolutionary career development, and ended up employing domestic staff to take on a lot of the responsibility of parenthood. This was probably a considerable flashpoint of controversy between Stalin and Nadia, and after the honeymoon period was over, their marriage became tempestuous. There were good times, like the holidays in Stalin's Dachau on the Soviet Riviera, Stories come down to us of the children picking blackberries, having picnics. It's easy to forget, in our image of frozen Russia, that a lot of the territory of the USSR was very pleasant in the summer. You could grow oranges. Montefiore, in a charmingly systematic way, estimates that 10% of the lit letters written between Stalin and the members of his inner circle concern the holidays they were going to take. Love letters between Stalin and Nadia have a sort of abbreviated code, and isn't it strange how the declarations of love over time once unthinkably glorious, can become devalued, become abbreviated, become routine, become expected. And yet at the same time, having a special abbreviation for I kiss you many times is not the image we traditionally have of Stalin. They clearly loved each other after a fashion, but things were far from constantly happy. It's generally considered by history that Nadia had some kind of mental illness, which her daughter Svetlana, who was born in 1926, described as schizophrenia. Schizophrenic, however, is a very specific diagnosis that's often misused, and this problem was especially bad in the 20th century before modern statistical manuals for diagnosis. It seems more likely that Nadja had manic depression. Living with the head of a vast superstate who was personally responsible for the deaths of millions, believing intensely that you and he were in some way destined to lead the world towards revolution, and raising three children, one of whom wasn't your own, is likely to be stressful enough to worsen any condition you might have. Nadia was strict towards the children, and apparently not particularly affectionate, with her affection reserved for Stalin. For his part, he was enamoured with his daughter, and more or less indifferent towards his sons. He found his first son from Georgia, Yakov, irritatingly slow. When he married a local priest's daughter, Stalin did not approve, wanting him to continue to study, 
It's also true that the Bolsheviks were persecuting the priests at this time, so having his own son marry a priest's daughter was probably an embarrassment. Everything seemed heightened in the Stalin family, and Yakov, in classic teenage angst, shot himself, but only managed to graze his chest. This cry for help led to disgust from Nadia, and Stalin joked that his son couldn't even shoot straight. It's not exactly a compassionate response, is it? Possibly looking to escape domestic drudgery, and maybe out of revolutionary fervour, and maybe because she felt her career as a secretary was stalling. Nadia enrolled in the Industrial Academy in Moscow in a course about the manufacture of artificial fibres. There, she was treated just like an ordinary student, with no reference made to the fact that she was married to one of the most powerful men in the world. And maybe that was exactly what she wanted. Although Stalin was affectionate in his letters, it doesn't feel like he quite lived up to the ideal that the schoolgirl Nadia had in mind. The template for his relationships with women after his first wife was that they were objects of convenience, with his true love and drive and energy always focused on his political career. And you get the sense that even when he married Nadia, he never made the shift to family man. Part of him was always likely hoping for someone who'd meekly stay in the background, which Nadia, with her rages and depressions, never would. Not that her rages and depressions were entirely unjustified. Stalin regularly flirted with other women, and almost certainly had affairs with many of the other women in the Bolshevik inner circle, luring girlfriends away from other prominent communists like Molotov. These were also liaisons of a strictly casual and disposable nature. He always returned to Nadia when the latest depressive episode had finished. Although when you put it like that, it hardly sounds like a sign of loyalty. From the outside, away from the intensity of the emotions, it seems obvious that this was not a match that either of them had hoped for or needed. Nadia was not meek, subservient and silent. They fought in public, and Stalin's fellow party members said behind closed doors that they'd never tolerate their wives treating them like that. So much for the equality between the sexes that the Bolsheviks talked about. So, not a meek housewife, but nor was she the power behind the throne, as in many other successful dynamics between so-called great men and their wives. On Stalin's part, if he was capable of sustained love for anyone, the kind of sustained affection that Nadja likely needed, it's not clear that she was the person. Even though they had their good times, the fact remained. She was deeply unstable. He was emotionally damaged, if not emotionally dead by most people's standards. In some ways, it would almost be surprising if a man such as Stalin was truly able to be happy, to have a functioning family outside of office hours, and return to ruthless leadership the rest of the time. Is it really such a shock in the end that tragedy came home to roost for the Stalins? Thank you for listening to this episode. If you've enjoyed Autocracy Now, please leave us a review or rate us on iTunes. I know everyone always says this, but it's the best way to get us noticed, without me having to stand on a busy street wearing a sandwich board. You can visit our website at www.autocracynowpodcast.wordpress.com. You can email the show with your comments, questions, concerns, or if there's another dictator you'd like me to cover, you can email us at autocracynow at outlook.com. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and even donate to the show if you like. Tell your friends, tell your enemies, tell some strangers. Next episode, we'll deal with Stalin's dramatic political turn once he has absolute power. The NEP will be abandoned, and in its place, the five-year plans. Our theme music is The Spirit of Russian Love by Zinadia Trokai, and you can find her stuff at costat.bandcamp.com. That's K-O-S-T-A dot I hope you've enjoyed this episode. <laughs>